I am a Michelle Bachelet fan. I admit it. I was delighted when she got the job running UN Women. When she was appointed to head the UN's new super agency, the entire staff felt like it was a friend who had been given the top job. <laughs> Women's E! News has covered Ms. Bachelet regularly. Stories such as when as president, she announced pensions for stay-at-home wives, selected a cabinet with an equal number of men and women, and took up the issue of daycare, daycare in international forums. These are just some of the 30-plus stories that we have written. Through her long public career, Michelle Bachelet has made news by gaining power and consistently leveraging it on behalf of women and girls. Therefore, Under Secretary General Michelle Bachelet, I am delighted to see you once again, this time in Manhattan, and on behalf of Women's E! News Board, staff, supporters, audiences, I am extremely proud to present you with the first ever Women's E! News 21 Leaders for the 21st Century Newsmaker of the Decade Award. Thank you, please come. Well, thank you, Rita, for that warm introduction and that incredible surprise. Um, as you said, it is for me a pleasure to be here. And um, I want to thank all of the staff of the Women's E! News who have made sure I have made headlines since coming to New York and before. And I said it, of course, that sounds like a joke, but it's so important to be civilized, uh, to give notice to that wonderful people, wonderful women who are there, like the amazing stories that we have already heard. And it's so important that you have been playing this role for so many years, because it means that you have been an essential part on progress towards a better world for women and girls. I'm especially pleased to be here with so many outstanding leaders who have brought attention to issues that otherwise might go unnoticed. Um, because you offer inspiration to all of us seeking to empower or to generate all the conditions so women can be more powerful, and especially those more vulnerable. And as first head of UN Women, I have pledged to champion the rights of women and girls in all of these areas, all of the areas we already heard and probably the ones we'll be hearing afterwards, including, of course, ending violence against women and girls and particularly promoting leaderships in all the fields. In creating you and women, we had to consolidate four smaller agencies, that you, uh, members that recognized that if we wanted to advance on gender equality, uh, we needed to accelerate progress on all development goals, it was necessary to send a clear signal that uh, gender equality and women's rights are on a par with other imperatives like ending poverty or combating climate change. And we know that to bring about change that is needed, we will need to build strong partnership. Many of you have been saying that how important it is in, on one hand to find, so women can find their voices, and many of you have helped also in the women's voices to be heard. And I think in order to not have single, isolated voices, we all need to work together to build a strong partnership in terms of enhancing women's voices, leadership, participation, so we can ensure a better world for women and girls. And we are doing that. We're working with the partners of the UN system, as well with government, civil society, private sector, foundations, and the media to enable us to build on the momentum for change. And I believe that we need to go from rhetorics to action, because in many places you hear everybody is pro-gender equality and women's empowerment. 
Who could say it's against that? But we need to make a shift. We need to advance much more and really make it a reality. That's why we are we're working also a lot on women's empowerment and has already caught the interest of key players, including corporations and the media. And probably we all know who are sitting here that the World Economic Forum Gender Gap Report shows that across 134 countries, greater gender equality correlates positively with GNP per capita. And also that a study of Fortune 500 companies found that those with three or more women board members outperform others by 53%. So every time, why I mention this? Because when you hear all the stories and all the ones that I've been seeing my whole life as minister, as president, and now as executive director and the secretary general of UN Women, it's true that we see women who are suffering, women who have pain, women who have a very difficult situation, but in all of these cases, as in all the cases of the women we have heard and the women who are sitting here, we all see brave, courageous women with a lot of power that only needs to get together to be able to really advance and progress, even there's a lot of difficulties, there are a lot of obstacles, and there's a lot of challenges. But what I would say is that for me, women can be victims and we need to prevent all those violations of their rights. We need to promote their capacities. But we, mainly I see women as agents of change, as agents of development, as, as so important part of all of our societies. So we are working on enhancing their capacities in terms of being able to, um, to, be, uh, to, to make clearly and visible the contribution they do every day in our society. So that's why I was mentioning to you these concrete facts that shows how important women are, not only building a family, that's very important, essential role, a part of the communities, that's also very important. As politicians, unfortunately, not too many. I hope we have more. Uh, in, but also in the economy, and also in the engineers, as we heard our friend there, in so many other places. But we know also, and that's why for me, political empowerment and economic empowerment is so important. Because women who earn their own income can also challenge the way household decisions are made, but can also demand the right to be free from violence. That's why empowering women in all sense is a key priority for UN women, and one of which we will pull the UN system all together. And we must work together to support women in terms of in giving them more opportunities to good jobs, asset building and extension of social protection to all workers. I mentioned that another priority is political participation. And I think it's a basic prerequisite for women's empowerment, but not only for women empowerment, it's for a genuine democracy. How could we have a very stable, consolidated, and more perfect democracy if half of the society is not well represented? And And I want to mention that women are eager to take on this role. Because I've been in Egypt, I will be soon in, in Tunisia, and across the Arab region, women who once were not in the public arena are now demanding the right to participate in revitalizing the societies. And as some women mentioned in a meeting some time ago, women don't know, I mean, not only want to be sitting at the table, they want to be able to reshape the table. And I think that's very important. And in, may, in those places that are very interesting, including running for office and participating in constitutional reform processes, for us also, ending violence against women is very high on our agenda because it's endemic in all countries. And countries are also starting not only to be more aware of this issue, but also they're starting to count cost. And in the United States, even though the data is a little bit old, I, I haven't seen new data, uh, the, exam the, the cost ran an estimate of U.S. 5.8 billion a year in extra health and mental care and lost productivity. In Canada, with a smaller population and lower health care cost, the total is about $1.16 billion. And a survey last year from Australia 
uh, more comprehensive in terms of which kind of costs they included. It's $13.6 billion a year, uh, Australian dollars a year, in terms of domestic violence. But of course, when you are talking about women in conflict and post-conflict countries, it's much more complicated. And the, the cost go to women go far beyond this estimate, especially in those situations. And the blurring of the line between the battlefield and the home in many of today's conflict means that civilians are increasingly targeted and subjected to sexual violence and abuse. And here, too, there is momentum for change. Rape is now recognized and punished as a war crime or, or crime against humanity, depending on the specific circumstances. But of course, much more is needed from all of us. And to be able to get these results in all the areas that I could mention, and I won't speak so more, more so don't, don't worry, uh, I, re I really believe that um, uh, we know that uh, UN Women needs to strengthen our own capacity and that of our partners, including women's rights groups, because change is fastest when a whole range of forces are working for the same goal. And together we need to find a way to harness our energies, the, the knowledge and wealth created in countries like this one and channel it to those who are still left out so that we can make the achievement of women's rights and gender equality the banner headline of the decade. I want to say that I was thinking while hearing everybody here, and look at the faces that many of us were having while hearing these incredible stories. I think that there's much we have all in common, women and men who are here attending. And it's we are women and men who care. But are not also, not only care, but we do understand that care is synonym of action and also not to be intimidated. So let's continue doing, because somebody said, I do what I have to do. I always phrased a movie, uh, in a movie, uh, I don't remember exactly, a very old actress always says, a girl has to do what a girl has to do. <laughs> so when I had to be candidate for the Republic, at the beginning I was not so sure that's what I wanted to do in my life, at that time of my life. But then I said to myself, a girl has to do what a girl has to do. <laughs> so. Girls and boy, let's continue doing what we have to do. Thank you very much. Wow. Oh, wow. Valerie, from being a little girl who was invisible to a woman who's ready to run the world for UN Secretary General, it's begun tonight. 